Is it okay? All right, so um, let's get started. Um, I'm G, uh, I'm from Twitter, and this is Michael from Mesosphere. Uh, we're gonna talk about um, supporting stable services on Mesos using um, persistence primitives. So this is the outline of our talk. I'm gonna first go through the motivation why we need uh, these two primitives, and then we're gonna go through each of them. Uh, one is called dynamic reservation, the other one is called persistent volume. And then uh, we're gonna go through the implementation. Hopefully you can understand the impl implication of these two primitives, and then uh, we're gonna talk about the current status and the future work. Um, all right, so first of all, we need to understand uh, what is a stateful service. So my understanding is that a stateful service is a, sta uh, is a service that persists state, and uh, its execution relies on its persisted state. So a typical stateful service is, for instance, like a, a messaging system or a account management system uses external storage services to um, persist states. Um, the external storage service can be a, a database like MySQL or a, a distributed file system like HDFS or a key value store like Dynamo. Um, however, uh, those stateful services are actually stateless to Mesos. Um, the reason is because uh, when such a service crashes on a Mesos node, it can be rescheduled to any other node in the cluster and uh, recover its state from the external storage, external storage service. So what is uh, stateful services in Mesos? So some stateful services need to persist data in its local disk. And for example, the storage services itself. Um, these kind of services are stateful to Mesos because um, when they crash, they have to be relaunched on the same node uh, that contain its persisted state. So in other words, Mesos needs to remember where those uh, services are launched previously. So in this talk, we're gonna, go, we're gonna focus in on these kind of storage-like services that are stateful to Mesos. Um, so this is the, um, so prior to Mesos 0.23, um, there's no primitive for our storage services. So those um, storage services are typically managed out of band of Mesos. Um, the resource used by those storage services are uh, usually statically partitioned and uh, people usually, like operators usually use a separate deploy flow to deploy those storage services. And that's bad, um, we're gonna solve that. So um, these, actually there are like, two major problems to run storage services on Mesos. Uh, one is resource reservation, the other problem is data persistence. Um, let me explain these two problems using an example. So if a task dies on a, Mesos uh, on a Mesos agent, it's not guaranteed that the resources used by the task will be re-offered to the same framework. So it's problematic for, um, this is very problematic for storage services because the framework might not be able to restart um, the service on the node that contains its persisted state um, due to lack of resource like CPU and memory. So, but although like some, some, some storage services might be able to re-replicate the data like HDFS, it might be able to re-replicate data from other nodes, but, uh, but that re-replication is usually pretty expensive. So another problem we can see is like currently in Mesos, a task is only supposed to write its own sandbox and the sandbox will be garbage collected after the task finishes. So, so in Mesos right now, you don't really have a way to persist data. So that's two problems we have right now. So, um, but workarounds do exist. People use workaround a lot. So, so for example, for the, for the resource reservation problem, you can use um, stack reservation already exists in Mesos. And for the data persistence problem, you can use a solution like write to an out of band location. So let me walk through um, these workaround using an example. Say you want to run MySQL on Mesos. Uh, with static reservation, the operator can reserve resources for the framework during slave start. So consequently, those resources won't be allocated to any other framework. So in this example, we start a Mesos agent uh, with resource reserved to the role MySQL, and the only framework in the role MySQL is able to uh, receive offers containing those resources. Um, however, um, static reservation is not ideal. It introduces static partition to the cluster and uh, incur huge burden on the operators. So imagine that the operator needs to um, update the config every time you have a new storage service join the Mesos cluster. So that's very painful. Also currently like modifying those uh, slave configuration require a slave restart. That means you, you have to kill all the running tasks uh, running on that node. Uh, although we might, we might be able to solve that problem in the future, but it's not exist right now. Um, for the data persistence problem, the workaround is to um, write to a out of band location. Um, for example, you can start the MySQL server uh, and specify the data directory to be var MySQL, 
and it's a well-known location outside the sandbox, so it won't be garbage collected. So, however, this could lead to uh, isolation problems. For example, a disk usage used by the MySQL server is not accounted for by Mesos. Uh, it could affect other tasks running on the same box. Imagine like the MySQL use up all the disk space on that node and no other task can be launched, um, and that's bad. And also likely that two framework uh, actually compete on the same out-of-band location, like you have two MySQL instances running and that compete on the same location, that can lead to uh, non-deterministic results. So um, to solve these two problems, so we introduce um, two primitives. So for the resource reservation problem, we uh, introduce a notion called dynamic reservation. And for the data persistence problem, we introduce a notion called persistent volume. So, okay, primitive one, dynamic reservation. The dynamic reservation primitive enable operator or framework to dynamically reserve and unreserve resources after slave started. And similar to static reservation, it guaranteed that uh, a stateful services, uh, a stateful task can be relaunched on the same slave containing their persisted state without, without the operation burden. And the, the persistent volume primitives allow task um, to persist data in some location that's managed by Mesos, and it won't be garbage collected even if the task finishes. And it will, it, will, it, will, it will only be deleted when the user explicitly requests that volume to be deleted. So when a task finishes, a frame can launch a new task, um, and that task is able to access the persistent data uh, written by a previous task. Um, so uh, Michael is gonna go through um, the dynamic reservation primitive in detail. Hi, I'm Michael Park. Um, I worked on dynamic reservations. So is that a bit too loud? Or should I talk a little quieter? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I'm gonna take you through the details of dynamic reservation. Um, G is gonna come back and cover persistent volumes, um, but I want you guys to note that many of the mechanisms that, are, mechanisms that, are gonna, that I'm gonna cover for dynamic reservation also apply to persistent volume. Um, so keep that in mind because when G goes back to persistent volumes, he'll be flying through those slides um, because I, have a, I would have already covered it. Okay, so there are two APIs, uh, one for the framework and the other one is for operators. Um, the framework goes through the offer cycle, uh, whereas the operators are provided with two uh, uh, master endpoints. Um, so an operator would submit a, an HTTP post request uh, to a master endpoint. Um, you can see slash reserve and slash unreserve are available. Um, and for the frame, on the framework side, let's cover the accept offers mechanism because that's new. So in the past, the only possible response to an offer um, was to launch tasks. So you would get a certain number of uh, resources offered to you, and the only thing you can do with them is either to hold on to them or to respond by saying, launch my task using these resources. Um, now we've generalized, generalized this uh, mechanism to accept offers where given an offer, you can do any given number of things. So uh, an offer operation, um, aside from launch, which is, some, which is something that we had from before, um, we also have unreserve and, uh, reserve and unreserve, which are the new uh, operations that you can do onto the offers that you're given. So this is the reserve offer cycle that I'm gonna go through here. Um, it's the relationship between the master and the framework. Uh, note that the what I, what, what, I, what I would like you to note here is that the, the, the reservations are made for a role, not for a framework uh, itself. So it's important that the framework's role is marked as MySQL. Um, I'm gonna continue with the MySQL uh, example that G presented you. So the first, the first thing is all, uh, something that we all know about. A framework receives an offer that contains unreserved resources. Um, the framework can now respond to this offer by sending back a reserve operation um, with containing the resources that we want to reserve, right? So uh, something that's important is that the framework is required to specify which role that it wants to reserve the resources for. In a subsequent offer then, magic happens in the background, master talks to the agent, um, and then the, the framework then receives an offer that includes the reserved resources. So now these resources are reserved for this role, um, and the frameworks that are in that role will receive these resources uh, continuously. So on the other side of it, unreserve, as you might expect, unreserve operation is the exact inverse of reserve. Um, the framework first receives an offer that includes reserved resources. Um, you can see that this is just a continuation of the end of this diagram here. 
Oh, sorry about that. So now we can, we can, we can accept these, this offer by sending back an unreserved operation cont containing the resources that we want to unreserve. In a subsequent offer, we get a new offer which includes the unreserved resources. So something that, I, something that I mentioned earlier is that in the accept message, you can specify a list of operations that you can perform. And so these happen in sequence. And this example illustrates how the, uh, if we specify two operations that are, that, that, that are supposed to happen in sequence, we can do it in a, in a single offer cycle rather than having to go through a single off, first offer cycle going through the reserve and another offer cycle to launch the, uh, launch the task that you want to run. So again, we receive an offer with unreserved resources. We send back, we, we accept this offer by saying the first thing we want to do is reserve, these, uh, reserve two CPUs and all of the memory. And so subsequently, I want you to run a task using those reserved resources. So this is a way to, uh, this, is a, this, this, is, this is really an optimization uh, so that we can save offer cycles so that frameworks, has, frameworks don't have to do as much work to get their tasks launched, uh, proceeding their reservations, re reservation requests. Um, next thing I'll cover is, so after assuming that the t la t tasks launch correctly and they're still running, the, next, the subsequent offer will be uh, the portion that we didn't use. So this is the protocol definition of the accept message. Um, as I mentioned, you can see that we've got a sequence of operations to be performed. Um, that's number two, which is operations. Um, if we look inside operation uh, message, we can see this is the union trick uh, for protobufs where we can specify either launch, reserve, unreserve, or any other things that we want to we wanna explore. Um, and we'll cover some more options here when we get to persistent volumes. So authorization. Um, before I get to the operator API, I'd like to cover authorization in the context of frameworks first. Um, when it comes to authorization, we really have to answer two questions. Uh, the first one is regarding reserve, and the other one, of course, is unreserve. So we have questions like, what, re what resources can a framework reserve? Or how much resources can a framework reserve? Um, on the unreserved side, we have questions like, can a framework X unreserved resources reserved by framework Y? Um, can an operator unreserved frameworks? Um, a firm, uh, can an operator unreserved resources that are reserved by any framework? Um, do we have operator level frameworks that have operator level privileges that can unreserve any framework? Um, so these are the questions that we have that we want to answer with authorization. So we have ACLs already in Mesos. Um, that we're going to use uh, for authorization of uh, reservations. Um, if you don't already know about ACLs, uh, we use security principles in Mesos to identify ent entities uh, for authorization purposes. Every framework and operator has a principle, a security pr principle associated to them. So on the, on the ACL side, we have the reserve ACL, which specifies what principles um, can reserve resources. And on the unreserved, unreserved ACL side, we have it specifies what principles can unreserve which principles uh, reserved resources. So what that means is, for example, we can have an operator principle called ops that are allowed to unreserve any principles resources. Right? And in order to do that, we, we need to keep track of the principle that reserved the resource. So the principle of the reserving entity is saved inside the reservation info within the resource message. So we can see the resource message, which contains things like roles, uh, the amount, uh, whether it's a scalar or not, whether, it, whether it's disk, all this kind of different stuff. Um, and the, uh, the augmentation on top of that is the reservation info, which has the principle inside. Um, and that, princi that principle specifies the, res the, the principle of the reserving entity. Um, and this is used for uh, unreservation um, for authorization. Okay, so here's a quick example. Um, if we were to, this is, this, is, this is the example that we went through before already, um, but what I'm showing you here is the principle. Uh, so if the fr framework my, uh, in role MySQL, for example, has a principle DBA. Um, if we were to zoom into this resource message here, we see the role is MySQL, as it should be, and we also have a reservation field there which has the principle of the framework that's making the reservation. Okay, now we get to upper API. So there are two HTTP endpoints, slash reserve and unreserve. Um, and we specify the agent ID and the resource to, resources to be reserved or unreserved. Um, this, is pretty, this is pretty simple um, in terms of semantics. 
the operator APIs are useful and necessary in order to dynamically partition the cluster into roles. Um, so what I mean by that is we, uh, we, had, we, we, we already had static reservations which allowed you to statically partition the cluster. Um, but this kind of goes against what Mesos is all about, which is to avoid static reservation, uh, uh, static partitioning. Um, but we needed it to provide guarantees around some of the frameworks that were high priority. Um, but rather than having to uh, resort to static partitioning, we can dynamically partition the cluster into different roles using dynamic reservations. The other side of it is to clean up reservations. So if a framework makes reservations and they have some resources that they're holding onto that they keep getting uh, offered, and the framework crashes. Currently, because the frameworks, uh, because the reservations are associated to the roles, they don't, we don't have a way to really clean up the reserve the resources without, uh, without potentially taking it away from other frameworks in that role that need that resource. So an operator, operator API uh, comes into play where we need, to, uh, we, need to, we need to let the operator at least clean up after these uh, frameworks that crash and have resources that are reserved. Okay, so the last thing I'll share with you is the static versus dynamic reservation distinguish it, uh, distinguishing factors. Uh, some of them I've already mentioned, uh, but static reservations are specified on the command line. Um, so this, this would be the dash dash resources flag uh, in which you can specify the unreserved portions of your, of your resources as well as the reserved portions. And these are really immutable without a, a, full, a full agent startup. Um, and as G mentioned, this requires flushing, draining of all the tasks that are currently running on the, on the, on the, on the, on the node, um, which is very undesirable. On the other side, dynamic reservations, they're specified by frameworks and operators, as I just mentioned, uh, and they allow for live updates. Uh, so you don't need to restart, restart the agents or anything like that. Um, you can change your configurations on the fly. Okay. So G will come back and talk to us about prison of volume. Thanks. Um, okay, so I, I mentioned like there are like two problems, the, data, uh, the, the reservation problem and the data persistence problem. So the persistent volume um, primitive is used to solve the data persistence problem. So it allows, it allows tasks to write on um, persistent data which won't be garbage collected. Um, and when task finishes, um, the firm can relaunch the task and uh, still access to its previously uh, written data. So um, uh, similar to um, dynamic reservation, persistent volume has framework API and operator API. And uh, the whole workflow is very similar to uh, dynamic reservation. So I'm going to skip this um, slide. So I'm going to go through on um, the cycle. Uh, it's very similar. As I mentioned, it's very similar to dynamic reservation. So say a framework wants to, um, so, so um, a framework receives an offer containing um, 800 disk, 800 disk. And uh, the framework can reply the offer with a um, accept call and with a, an operation called create. A create is gonna um, uh, the create the, the framework needs to specify how many disk space you want to use to create that volume, and uh, the framework also needs to specify a unique persistence ID, and that ID is generated by framework. And once that's created. Um, uh, you're, uh, the framework is going to get to uh, get an offer containing two disk resources. 200, meg, uh, 200 uh, megabytes for um, the sandbox and uh, 600, uh, 600 megabytes for the uh, persistent volume. And uh, the framework can just use that um, volume disk resources to launch its task and then it can be accessed to uh, its volume. So I'm going to talk about how the, framework can, how the framework can access its volume. So that's the disk info we add into the resource object. It's similar to reservation info. So in the disk info, um, there's a persistent ID field, which this framework, as I mentioned, framework generate a unique ID for its persistent volume. And also framework can specify a volume field. A volume contain a container pass and a host pass and a, a mode. Mode, I mean like read only or read write. So the framework can specify a container pass, say, hey, where in the container I want this volume to be mounted. So if you look at this example, um, uh, if you zoom in the accept a message, um, when framework specify um, the create operation, it specify the disk info and specify in a persistent ID A and specify a volume. And the volume contains a container path and uh, its value is data, which means there, is a, there will be a data directory created inside the sandbox and the framework can just access that um, persistent volume through that directory. And the mode of that volume is read write. <coughs> 
So destroy, uh, it's gonna go through the similar process as unreserved, so I'm gonna skip this one. So the framework API is pretty similar to um, dynamic reservation. We create two new types, one called create, one called, and the other one is called destroy. Uh, you can specify the resource you wanna create and the resource you wanna destroy. So the resource here, I mean, is a disk resource. And uh, uh, for, uh, for operator API, uh, we introduce slash create and slash destroy. And, uh, and the reason why we introduce those operator API is because we want to clean up those persistent volumes if framework dies, because those, those resources become sticky uh, after you create those volumes. So we need some API, uh, so operator API to clean those thing up. Um, okay, this is a pretty important slide. So uh, we need to understand like, um, so basically we impose a restriction on persistent volume and in the, the reservation. So um, persist on, persistent volume can only exist on uh, reservation, resor reserved resources. And what that means is like, well, we can only create persistent volume on statically or dynamically reserved resources and uh, um, it cannot be unreserved. Um, so we cannot unreserve persistent volume without destroying the volume first. So um, the reason we introduce this um, restriction is because uh, we have, so imagine you're using persistent volume, you have some data persist on the, on the slave host. And uh, since um, the data is there, so you cannot re-offer that disk resource to other frameworks because it's already being used by someone. So that's the reason we introduce this uh, restriction. All right, uh, I think MPAR is gonna go through the implementation. As, uh, as MPAR mentioned, like implementation is pretty similar for dynamic reservation and persistent volume. Yeah, so the implementation, they go through the same, uh, same process. Uh, so we're, I'm only gonna explain a, gen a generic uh, process in, in which both of the primitives go through. Um, the first step is validation. Uh, we need to, the master needs to validate the, the, the request, uh, make sure that it's sane. The, the, the most important part is probably checkpoint. Um, so this, the, the agent <laughs> checkpoints the reserve the resource information um, as well as the persistent volume information on the, on the node itself. Um, that makes it so that the data is persisted through uh, agent restarts, even if an agent gets, uh, gets assigned a new ID um, and has to register rather than re-register. The, the checkpoint information will still be there. Um, and in order to reconcile uh, in case of failure, such, like, uh, such as master failover, um, we, when the agent re registers or re-registers, it reports the checkpointed data uh, up to the master. Okay, so we'll go through. So you've seen, you've seen the right-hand side of this already, uh, master and the framework. You've seen what happens there. I'm going to show you roughly what happens between the agent and the master. Um, so the first thing, the first thing that happens is we register re or re-register re with the re resources that, we're, that are specified on the dash dash resources flag. So in this case, we specified all of them to be unreserved, um, which then gets offered to the framework, right? And let's say the, the framework uh, wants to reserve a partial, 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 uh, partial offer. Then from here, I said that magic happens and master offers the subsequent off in the subsequent offer offers the reserved resources. Um, what happens here is that master sends a checkpoint a checkpoint message over to the agent for it to be checkpointed. So you can see that the left uh, uh, cylinder at the, at the on the left there is the is the disk on the on the agent agent node which gets checkpointed. Um, and in this subsequent in this example, I'll show you that even if the agent goes down, it'll still, after it reboots, the data is still there, and it'll use that data to report to the master uh, in terms of the amount of resources that it has, which then gets offered to the framework, and the data is, survives, or the, reser the, the reservation survives uh, uh, agent failures, as well as master failovers. Okay. So I'll go through the current status with you guys. Um, this is the current status of things. So lots of things are coming. <laughs> Opera API and authorization are actually currently going through code review. Um, so we hope to get that committed soon. Um, the framework API and for both dynamic reservation and persistent volumes are there today. Um, and we decided to prioritize that one first because we wanted to, we wanted to support the storage, ser storage service framework such as MySQL, HDFS, um, and Cassandra um, and let them take, take, take advantage of it. 
Um, and we can catch up with the operator API and stuff like that coming soon. Future work. Um, so I've got four things that I want to mention to you guys here. Uh, multiple disk support is, is something that's been um, heavily requested. Uh, some storage services require access to multiple storages um, for performance or for correctness. Um, I think Cassandra and Zookeeper, uh, in some cases, need multiple disk support. Um, disk isolation, this is for once storage services actually become frameworks that run on Mesos. We, want, we ideally want to isolate their I.O. bandwidth um, between other services that are running on Mesos as well. So, we can, so that way we can provide certain guarantees for the, for, the, for the high priority frameworks that are running on Mesos aside from the storage services. Um, quota support. This is something that Alex sh shared during our uh, uh, lightning talk earlier today. Um, so this is re resource reservation, um, except that it's not specific to an agent. Um, it's for anywhere in the cluster. So if your framework just requires some resources somewhere in the cluster and you don't need it to be on a specific machine, um, this, is, this, is, this is what you, what you should be reaching for in most cases. Okay. Um, dynamic res res reservation template. And this one is really there to complete the deprecation cycle for static reservation. Um, so what you'll realize, the difference between static reservation and dynamic reservation is that you can't specify dynamic reservations before you start your agent. So if we had a template stored on the, stored on the master in which when, whenever a new agent joins, they automatically get this template applied to them on their startup, um, then we could actually support basically everything that static reservations can do, and we can actively um, recommend people not to use static reservations. So in summary, running stateful re uh, services on Mesos, most services should really uh, reach for uh, storage services that run on Mesos. Um, so if we, once we introduce, uh, once we get HDFS and other frameworks using persistent volumes and dynamic reservations, um, it'll be much easier to handle them in your clusters. Um, and storage-like services will still require these new, new primitives in order to get back to the same machine that they're storing, storing, their, storing their data on um, and things like that. So we covered two primitives that were introduced to O23, dynamic reservation. The ticket is 2018. Um, I got pretty familiar with that number over time. User documentation is available under the docs directory, um, reservation.md. Persistent volume is 1554. And, and user documentation you can also find um, to help you get through some of the beginning phases of using these primitives. Okay. We'll go through some acknowledgments here. Um, Adam, Ben, Ben Hyman, Vinod, Ben Mahler, Alex. All these guys helped a lot. And anyone else who, who, who participated and, give, and gave feedback in our discussions, thank you to everyone who participated. Thank you. Do you have any questions? I mean, you have to, and the framework has to deal with like this those kind of failures anyway, right? I mean, in the data center, like a uh, machine can go away, disk can be burned, so the framework needs to deal with that anyway. So if the disk is lost or the the slave just disappear, like um, that persistent volume and dynamic reservation will not come back. So the framework needs to deal with that and then reconcile. That. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Okay. And then, do you distinguish for the disks? Do you distinguish between SSDs and uh, regular platters or? Uh, right now, oh, we yeah. don't, but we plan to add that support. Um, oh, ice. sorry. Uh, so the question was, do we currently distinguish between SSDs and, and regular disks? Yeah, so disks. Well, we currently don't do that, but like we, uh, as you see in the disk info, like there's a disk info inside resources. We can potentially add a type information to this disk info, say, hey, um, this is the SSD disk, and this is a spindle disk, and what's the RPM of the disk, or whatever the thing, information, and the, uh, the framework can look into those details in the disk info and decide which disk to use. That will be um, part of the multi-disk support in the future. So yeah, we are working on that. Thank you. So you've shown earlier the uh, checkpointing of that partitioning on the slate. So the framework sends in the information saying, I want to reserve that much for this role and it has to hit the slate. 
does that mean as a framework author I need to be um, aware that it's possible that information gets lost? That even though I try to allocate a resource to a given role, it actually never hits the slate because it dies in the meantime. Is it something I have to be aware of or is it something that mess of managers for me? Yeah, so, the so the question is what happens if the checkpoint message from the master to the slave or to the agent or um, if, for example, the message from framework to the master gets lost, um, does the framework have to account for that? And the answer is yes, you do have to account for that. Um, it's all of, all of, because we have a distributed system, all of the messages could be dropped. Um, we can't really guarantee um, the messages to reach, reach the agent. Um, currently, currently if, if, the, if the checkpoint operation fails at the agent itself, then we currently just crash. Um, which is a fine recovery mechanism. Um, we could probably expand upon that, but currently you, as, as a framework writer, you, you would have to account for that. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. On the, uh, the unreserved uh, callback, yep. can you unreserve just a subset of your previously reserved resources? So the question is, can you unreserve a subset of the reservation that you made previously? Um, the answer is yes for the resources that are, uh, uh, what's a good word for it? Let's say, yeah, not stateful is a good word. So, for example, if you get, correct, if you just get CPUs or memory, um, in the case of disk, uh, it could be in a stateless, stateless state, right? You can just have, you can just be given five gigs of disk. Um, but if you have, you're, if you're given persistent volumes, then you can't unreserve portion of that persistent volume. But in general, yes, you can unreserve subsets. So if you like notice subsets. you're only using one CPU and you had previously reserved two, you could just give one back? Yes. Yes, you can do that. Uh, yep. Just what, uh, what you're using to do um, to run the Cassandra on Mesos platforms and the um, MySQL on Mesos. Uh, Sorry, could you repeat the question? announced earlier uh, today that um, there were new projects like uh, Cassandra on Mesos Okay. Is this what it relies on? Not yet. So, so the question is, uh, the existing already announced frameworks such as Cassandra and MySQL, what do they run on? Do they run on this stuff? The answer is not yet. Um, currently, they, currently they rely on static reservation and storing data on known locations, um, which is what I meant earlier when I said the, the operational overhead of those frameworks will be lighter once, once we start leveraging these primitives. Uh, so there are two questions. The first question is, what if the slave, the disk is gone? I think I already answered this question. So if the slave, we, the framework has to deal with this, this situation anyway, because a machine can be burned or like whatever like happened to that machine. So the framework has to deal with that. Um, the second question is, um, what's the second question? Oh yeah, so replication. So. Um, no, we don't have replication for now. This is just a primitive for uh, storage-like services. So the replication should be deal with uh, on the top level, like the storage service itself needs to deal with those replication problems like HDF and to deal with replication itself, not Mesos. Mesos just provide those primitives. Does, uh, as part of Mesos, does Marathon have that ability to do replication of state of the containers if a slave node dies? Uh, from the, Adam, not yet. I, I don't know about Marathon, but from the, qu the question. The question was: Does Marathon support replication of data of containers? Correct. And the answer was not yet. Right. So, so the first step would be to get Marathon to use persistent volumes, which is something that's on my list. So the, that, that dies and not all three. Do you want to repeat the question? Uh, could you repeat the question? 
Sorry. Oh. So, so, the, so the question is, is Mesos going to offer resources to you from multiple agents in order to, in, in order, in order, in order to guarantee spread of your risk through like, the cluster? Um, if you're going through the framework, um, you're going to you're gonna be going through the offer, offer cycle. And so you can keep track of the slave ID, uh, the agent ID that comes, comes with their offer in order for you to, gr to guarantee that they're spread out across multiple agents. Right? Um, so yeah, I think I think this kind of like uh, um, decision should be made by framework, not Mesos. Framework gets yeah, framework has enough right. information to make those decisions, like the slave, oh, sorry, the agent ID. Like you get the agent ID, then you can decide whether you want to put like multiple volume on the same agent or like spread the volume to different agents. So it's up to the framework. Yep. Quick uh, question. So if I deploy a Docker container and if I'm running MySQL inside it, for example, and if the slave node dies, I have no way to recover okay. that data on that database, essentially. So let's just say I'm using Marathon and Mesos to deploy it. There's no yeah. uh, state replication to Zookeeper from the slave node perspective. So Whatever data that resides, resides only on that slave node. So the question was, if you're running a Docker container and you're running a MySQL instance inside the Docker container and the agent node dies, then the data is not persisted? Well, it's, that's and technically not true because you can still use persistent volume, although like, we don't have support for Docker containerizer yet, but like, that's on the plan. I mean, it's in our like, list. So if, say, we support persistent volume in Docker containerizer, then uh, you can like, mount in a volume, like say, hey, um, the data directory under the sandbox is for persistent volume, and you can write your MySQL data directory, like you can specify the MySQL data directory to that volume, and then everything you persist inside that directory will be persisted. Even if the Docker container dies and the slave reboot and restart, that volume will come back to the framework, and the framework can launch another task to recover those um, data written in that directory. And that volume has to be external somewhere, uh, outside of that container. Yeah, not in the sandbox, in the volume. So yeah, Docker container support is something that's coming soon. <laughs> yeah, but I, I want to add one more thing. So Docker container support is not there yet, but we are working on another one called Unify Container, which allow you to run Docker image, run Docker containers, not Docker container, but use Docker images with Mesos containerizer isolations, like allow you guys to kill the Docker daemon. So that's something in progress and will be done soon. Yay. We, we've also been in talks with the Cluster HQ Flocker which can support Docker volume migration. So we could do integration with that at some point in the future as well. Okay, so what good. Adam mentioned is that uh, there have been talks of a Flocker integration, which would help with Docker volume, migration. volume migrations. So the question is, can you combine reservations? Um, so the answer is, um, that's, something other, that's something that we want to build uh, for a long time. It's called task resize. Like you want to increase the size of uh, the resources used by a task. Is that what you're saying? Or I misunderstood? Well, even if it hasn't been given to a task, so uh, like when you launch, I guess when you launch a task, I guess you, you can just give multiple offers. So, so. So for, so for reservations, um, in terms of the combining and splitting of the resources, it, the reservation has nothing to do with it. Um, it, it, it. It depends on whether the resource is stateful or not. So if it's CPUs, for example, and you have 10 reserved CPUs, and you make another reservation of five, then on the next, on the next offer, you'll get a 15. Right? But if you, get, if you have a persistent volume of 10 gigs, and you, and you make another persistent volume of five gigs, you're going to get two separate, two separate uh, Volumes, right. And so they're not going to just merge. Even if they haven't been assigned to a, a task yet? Correct. Correct. They'll be, they'll, yeah, yeah. If it, because, because, because the volumes themselves have identity, 
you would have to destroy the volumes to get rid of the identity first and then give a new identity to them with a bigger, bigger size or smaller size or whatever you want to do with it. Yes. Um, so what yours was said is that if you have two volumes, 10 and 5, you can launch a task using both of those volumes um, mounted into different, different, different pads in your container. Okay, we have time for only one question. Oh, uh, Okay, so you're gonna go to the talk tomorrow. So there's a talk. <laughs> so there, so, so there's a talk about maintenance primitives uh, in Mesos. I think Bam Mario is gonna talk about this tomorrow afternoon. So if I mean, if I think that talk should address your question. Can you repeat? So like um, temporarily releasing reservations out or delegating reservations. Oh. Temporarily. Sorry, I, I don't get that. Same wrong. Oh, we can talk offline. Like if, sorry, um, yeah. It's you only got one question. Time. Um, All right, I think we're Thank you uh, for attending. Thank you.